Okay, so for this video, we'll be discussing about financial analysis using Microsoft Excel as part of our data analytics course. So introduction, you can perform financial analysis with Excel in an easy way. Excel provides you several financial functions such as PMT, PV, NPV, XNPV, IRR, MIRR, XIRR, and so on that enable you to quickly arrive at the financial analysis results. In this uh, video or this uh, lecture, you will learn where and how you can use these functions for your analysis. So first, we have, we have to answer what is NVT? An NVT is a series of constant cash payments made over a continuous period. For example, savings for retirement, insurance payments, home loan, mortgage, etc. In annuity functions, a positive number represents cash received and a negative number represents cash paid out. Present value of a series of future payments. The present value is the total amount that a series of future payments is, is worth now. You can calculate the present value using the Excel functions. So PV, that's why present value, calculates the present value of an investment by using an interest rate and a series of future payments, so negative values, and income for positive values. At least one of the cash flows must be positive and at least one must be negative. And PV calculates the net present value of an investment by using a discount rate and a series of periodic future payments, negative values, and income positive values. XNPV calculates the net present value for a schedule of cash flows that is not necessarily periodic. Note that PV cash flows must be constant whereas NPV cash flows can be variable. PV cash flows can either be at the beginning or at the end of the period whereas NPV cash flows must be at the end of the period. NPV cash flows must be periodic whereas XNPV cash flows need not be periodic. So in this video, you will understand how to work with PV. You will learn about NPV in a later section. Example, suppose you are buying a refrigerator. The salesperson tells you that the price of the refrigerator is 32000 but you have an option to pay out the amount in 8 years with an interest rate of 13% per annum <clears throat> and yearly payments of 6000 You also have an option to make the payments either at the beginning or end of each year. You want to know which of these options is beneficial for you. You can use Excel PV function. So the format is PV, then we have the rate, the end per, so pay, payment, FB, and then time. So let's see what are these. So to calculate present value with payments at the end of each year, omit type or specify zero. So we should omit this one if you want it to be at the end of each year. To calculate present value with payments at the end of each year, specify one. So I think this one is beginning of each year. Okay, so one if n, zero if at the beginning. Because they are quite the same. So let's see. Example. So we have here thirty-two thousand. Oh, so let's go back. If it is one, this is beginning. If it is zero, this is at the and so as uh, described here so we have here the price is 32,000 the interest rate is 13% number of payments is 8 and the payment is 6,000 so since it is payout then it should be negative and here we use the PV so C3 that's the price C4 uh, C3 that's the interest rate C4 is what the number of payments and c5 is the 
payment itself. And here, so we will get the present value of this uh, 6,000 payments each year, paid at the end of each year. And here, the same percent, the same rate, but paid at the beginning of each year. So we have here the interest rate, the number of payments, and then the amount. Then oops, we have here, uh, ignore this one, null, comma, and then one. So that means at the beginning of the year. So you notice that the present value of 32,000, if you this one is 28,793, while the present value, so we paid the same amount, but here we paid at the beginning, here we paid at the end. So you notice that the present value is 32,536. So that means that this one is more beneficial. So if you make the payment now, you need to pay 32,000 at present value. If you opt for yearly payments with payment at the end of each year, so at the end of each year, you need to pay 28,793 of present value. If you opt for yearly payments with the payment at the beginning, so this should be beginning of the year, you need to pay 32,536. So clearly, to see that the option two with this this option pay at the end of each year is beneficial for you now what is emi an equated monthly installment is defined by Investop uh, investopedia as a fixed payment amount made by a borrower to a lender at a specified date each calendar month Equated monthly installments are used to pay off both interest and principal each month so that over a specified number of years, the loan is paid off in full. EMI on a loan. In Excel, you can calculate the EMI on a loan with a PMT or payment function, PMT function. Suppose you want to take a home loan of 500, this is 5 million. 5 million with an annual interest rate of 11.5% and the term of the loan for 25 years you can find EMI as follows calculate interest rate per month interest rate per annum is so interest rate per annum divided by 12 so this is the rate per annum so per month is C2 divided by 12 calculate the number of monthly payments so if there's, there are 25 years so C4, that's 25 years times 12. That's the number of monthly payments. And then use PMT function to calculate EMI. So if this is the loan amount, so PMT is first we have for the interest rate or rate per month. Then we have the number of payments. And then six here is the value loan amount. And C7 is FB and C8 is type. So there are no future values, so one is for the type. That means at the beginning. So as you observe, present value PV is the loan pay amount. So that's the present value loan amount. Future value FB is zero, as, as at the end of the term, the loan amount should be zero. Type is 1 as EMIs are paid at the beginning of each month. So you will get the following result. So that means you're going to pay 52,139.81 every month to pay 5 million for 25 years. So EMI includes both interest and part payment as principal. As the time increases, the two components of EMI will vary, reducing the balance. To get the interest part of your monthly payments, you can use the Excel IPMT function. The payment of principal part of your monthly payments, you can use the Excel PPMT function. For example, if you have 
taken a loan of 1 million for a term of 8 months at the rate of 16% per annum, you can get values for the EMI, the decreasing interest amounts and the increasing payment of principal amounts and the diminishing loan balance over the 8 over the 8 months and the end of 8 months loan balance will be zero. So follow the procedure given below. So number one, calculate the EMI as follow. So we have here rate per annum, 16%. So divided by 12. So we have this one. Then monthly payments, 8. And then we have loan amount of 1 million. FB0 type is 0. EMI is PMT. So we have here the interest rate, C3. C4 is the number of payments. C5 is the loan amount and then c6 is the future value and c7 type is zero so that means you're going to pay thirteen thousand something 261.59 for the emi step two next calculate the interest and principal parts of the emi for the eight months as follows so the beginning balance is equal to D4, so 10,000. And this is the EMI, which is, we have a uniform number of payments. So that's 13,242. And then we have here the IPMT, the interest payment, and the principal payment. And the ending balance is, of course, equal to C10. So this one minus F. 10, the principal but so we're just uh, it should be sub subtracted to the principal so that's the ending balance and then this is copied copied also copied copied in this one so equal to G10 here on the next one so that's the balance ending balance here and then we just copy so it becomes G11. So only the first one should be placed because this one is equivalent to the amount here, the initial amount. So IPMT, the parameters of IPMT are, so we have here D2, which is actually the a principal amount. B10, which is what? It is the month number that's why b10 to b17 d3 to d4 these are oh no this is d3 that's the number of payments d4 that's the loan amount then comma comma then d6 is now the type okay and then we just copy the formula for the interest Payment. For the principal payment, we have again D2 here, which corresponds to our rate per month. Then we have B10, which corresponds to the month number. So that's, yes, that's a month number. And then D3 here is represented by the number of payments. Then D4 by the loan amount. Then we have two commas, if I can see it right. And then D6 now is the type. So we just copy and this is what we get. So this means that on the first payment of 13,000, we actually paid 11,000 something of the principal. And we paid 1,300 for the interest. And on the next, on the next payment, we paid one. 12,097.52 of the principal and this one for the interest. And this is our now ending balance. And on the third payment, the same. This is our principal payment and this is our interest payment. So as the balance goes down, so does the interest. And now, as the interest goes down, we are paying now more of the principal. So, at, at the end, that should be equal to zero. 
monthly payment of principal and interest on a loan. Interest and principals paid between two periods. You can compute the interest and principal paid between two periods inclusive. So compute the cumulative interest paid between two second and the third months using the cumulative I payment. So let's see. So CUM IPMT function. Verify the result summing up the interest values for second and third months. Compute the cumulative principal paid between second and third months using the cumulative principal function. And then verify the result summing up the principal values for second and third. So here, let we use the function cumulative interest payment. So D2 here represents the rate per month. D3 is what? D3 is the number of payments and D4 is the loan amount. 2 and 3 means second and third months. So between the two months and then D6 here represents the type. And here we have the cumulative principal payment. So again, D2 is the rate per month. D3 is the number of payments. D4 represents the loan amount 2 and 3 for second and third month and then D6 now is the type. Now similarly to check if they are the same we com we add what? We add E11 so E11 and E12 so these are the interest payments for the second and third months and to check for the cumulative principal payments we also added F11 and F12. So these two values should be equal. So you will get the following results. So you notice that using the cumulative I payment function, interest payment function, and the cumulative principal payment function will give us uh, equal results. Calculating interest rate. Suppose you take a loan of 100,000 and you want to pay back in 15 months with a maximum monthly payment of 1 or 12,000. You might want to know the interest rate at which you have to pay. So, again, you loan 100,000. You want to pay it in 15 mount, months and with 12,000 as monthly payment. Now, what should be the interest rate? So that is what we're going to compute here. So we can use the rate function. So we just place here C3, that's the number of payments. C4 is what? The monthly payment. And C2 is the loan amount. Then comma, comma, zero, comma. Then this will give us the interest rate. So the value that is given by this formula is 8%. So that means that if the interest rate is 8%, you have to pay 12,000 in 15 months to be able to pay for the 100,000 loan amount. Calculating term of loan. Suppose you take a loan of 100,000 at the interest rate. So again, uh, just to compare in the previous one, we are computing for the interest rate. So we are given the loan amount, number of months, and the payment. But here now, we have to compute for the number of payments. So we are given, so we are given the following value. So let's first read this one. Suppose you take a loan of 100,000, that's the amount, at the interest rate of 10%, so we have the interest rate. You want a maximum monthly payment of 15,000. You might want to know how long will it take for you to clear the loan. So find the number of payments with Excel and per function. Okay, so number of payments. So we have here loan amount, 100,000. Interest rate is 0.1 and the monthly payment is 15,000. So by using N per, we have C3 here. That is the interest rate. C4 is the monthly payment and C2 is the loan amount, comma, comma, zero. So this will give us 12. So that function will give us 12, meaning that if 
this is the interest rate and this is the monthly payment we should pay 12 months to be able to pay this principal or this loan amount decisions on investment when you want to make an investment you compare the different options and choose the one <clears throat> that yields be better returns net present value is useful in comparing cash flows over a period of time and deciding which one is better the cash flows can occur at regular periodical intervals or at irregular intervals first we consider the case of regular periodical cash flows the net present value of a sequence of cash flows received at different points in time in n years from now n can be a fraction is 1 divided by 1 plus r raised to n where r is the annual interest rate consider the following two investments over a period of three years so we have three years interest rate of 20 percent and these are two investments so here we paid 100,000 here we were able to get 25,000 and here 7,000 here negative 5,000 then 20,000 and then the total if you're going to get the total here is 8,000 here is 7,000 so at face value so if you're going to look at the face value investment one looks better than investment two however you can decide on which investment is better only when you know the true worth of the investment as of today so you can use the net present value function to calculate the return so we could we should not compute this using the face value the cash flow can occur at the end of every year at the beginning of every year or in the middle of every year npb function assumes that the cash flows are at the end of the year if the cash flows occur at different times when you have to take into account that particular factor along with the calculation with npv suppose the cash flows occur at the end of the year then you can straight away use the npv function so we use the npv function then we place here c2 that's the interest rate and then the cash flows will be from c2 to uh, c5 rather so c5 to c7 so that will give us the net present value and while here in the second so npv we use the same interest rate and the cash flows are from d5 to d7 so using this value now you will get the following result so this will give us 4976.85 well this will give us 5092.59 so as you observe in pb for investment two is higher than that for investment one hence investment two is a better choice you get this result as cash outflows for investment two are at later periods as compared to that of investment one cash flows at the beginning of the year suppose the cash flows occur at the beginning of every year in such a case you should not include the first cash flow in npv calculation is as it already represents the current value you need to add the first cash flow to the npv obtained from the rest of the cash flow to get the net present value so since it is already on the beginning so it is assumed here that this one will be part of that's already the present value so you notice it is already given here then plus the net present value of these two payments so that's why we have c5 plus npv of again that's the interest rate and then we only have c6 and c7 so d5 plus npv c2 and then we have the cash flow from d6 to d7 so this time the result is something like this so you will get the following results so this is at the beginning 
and still we can say that investment 2 is better than investment 1. Cash flows in the middle of the year. So what if it is in the middle of the year? Suppose the cash flows occur in the middle of the every year. In such a case, you will need to multiply the NPV obtained from the cash flow by the square root of uh, 1 plus R, the interest rate, to get the present net value. So as we have here, we have C10 is already the net present value, but we multiply this with the square root of 1 plus C2. So that is how we get the cash flows in the middle of the year. So here's square root of 1 plus C2 again times D10. So the result will be something like this. So this will be the net present value if the payments are made in the middle of the year. Cash flows at regular intervals. If you want to calculate the net present value with irregular cash flows, that is cash flows occurring at random times, the calculation is a bit complex. However, in Excel, you can easily do such a calculation with XNPV function. So arrange your data with the dates and the cash flows. So these are the dates and these are the cash flows. The first date in your data should be the earliest of all the dates and the other dates can occur in any order. So this should be the earliest and the other dates can be in any order. Use the XNPV function to calculate the net present value. So, so we have X and PV. C2 here is what? The interest rate. C4 to C11 is the cash flows. And then B4 to B11 are actually the dates. So you will get the following result. So the net present value of this cash flow is 17,523.65. Suppose today's date is 15th of March 2015. As you observe, all the dates of cash flows are of later dates. If you want to find the net present value as of the day, include it in the data at the top and specify zero for the cash flow. So again, if you want to find the net present value as of the day, is day to day included in the data so included in the data so this is uh, March uh, 15 2015 and at the top so place it at the top and specify zero for the cash flow so we have X and PV we have the interest rate C2 C4 to C12 that's the cash flow and B4 to B12 that's the date so we have here now the net present value so at irregular intervals and here the dates are already formatted internal rate of return internal rate of return or IRR of an investment is the rate of interest at which NPV is zero if it is the rate value for which the present value of a positive cash flow exactly compensate the negative ones. So when the discount rate is IRR, the investment is perfectly indifferent. That is, the investor is neither gaining nor losing money. Consider the following cash flows. So different interest rates and the corresponding NPV. So we have here the interest rates and in PV with the cash flows. You can observe between the values of interest rate 10% and 11%, the sign of NPV changes. When you fine tune the interest rate to 10.53, NPV is nearly zero. Hence, IRR is 10.53. That's internal rate of return. <coughs> So if you have interest rate, then this will be 
higher than 10.53, then that means you are more or less gaining. You have gained. Determining IRR of cash flows for a project. So the IRR is 10.53 as you had seen in the previous section. For the given cash flow, IRR may exist and unique exists and multiple so not exist. So let's try, look at this. So we have here the cash flow, IRR B3 to B6. So this will give us 10.53. Unique IRR. If IRR exists and is unique, it can be used to choose the best investment among several possibilities. If the IRR cash flow is negative, it means that the investor has the money and wants to invest. Then the higher the IRR, the better, since it represents the interest rate the investor is receiving. If the first cash flow is positive, it means that the investor needs money and is looking for a loan. The lower the IRR, the better, since it represents the interest rate the investor is paying. So to find if an IRR is unique or not, vary the guess values and calculate IRR. If IRR remains constant, then it is unique. So we have here IRR. So B3 to B6. So all B3 to B6. Then here we have the guess. D4, D5, D6. So this will be our guess. As you observe, the IRR has unique value for the different guess values. So for the different guess values, IRR is the same. So the IRR has a unique value for the different guess values. Multiple IRRs. In certain cases, you may have multiple IRRs. Consider the following cash flow. Calculate IRR with different guess values. So these are the different guess values. So the same as the previous one. And you'll notice that we have here now different values. So we have here multiple IRRs. You can observe that there are two IRRs, 9.59 and 216.09. You can verify these two IRRs by calculating the NPV, so net present value. For both 9.59 and 216.09, NPV is zero. In certain cases, you may not have IRR. Consider the following cash flows. Calculate IRR with different guess values. So these are the guess values. And you will get the result as num for all the guess values. The result num means that there is no IRR for the cash flow considered. Cash flow patterns and IRR. If there is only one sign change in the cash flows, such as from negative to positive or positive to negative, then a unique IRR is guaranteed. For example, in capital investments, the first cash flow will be negative, while the rest of the cash flows will be positive. In such cases, unique IRR exists. If there is more than one sign change in that cash flow, IRR may not exist. Even if it exists, it may not be unique. Decisions based on IRR. So main analysts prefer to use IRR, and it is a popular profitability measure because as a percentage, it is easy to understand and easy to compare to the required return. However, there are certain problems while making decisions with IRR. If you run with IRRs and make decisions based on these banks, you may end up with the wrong decisions. You have already seen that NPV will enable you to make financial decisions. However, IRR and NPV will not always lead to the same decision when projects are mutually exclusive. Mutually exclusive projects are those for which the selection of one project precludes the acceptance of another. When projects that are being compared are mutually exclusive, a ranking conflict may arise between NPV and IRR. If you have to choose between project A and project B, NPV may suggest acceptance of project A, whereas IRR may suggest project B. 
This type of conflict between NPB and IR may arise because one of the following reasons. The projects are of greatly different sizes or the timing of the cash flows are different. So projects of significant size differences. If you want to make a decision by IRR, project A yields to a return of 100 and project B a return of 50. Hence, investment on project A looks profitable. However, this is a wrong decision because of the difference in the scale of projects. So consider you have 1,000 to invest. If you invest entire 1,000 on a project A, you get a return of 10%. If you invest 100 in project B, you will still have 900 in your hand that you can invest on another project, say project C. Suppose you get return 20% on project C, then the total return on project B and project C is 200 30, which is way ahead in profitability, so as compared with 100. So thus, NPV is a better way for decision making in such cases. Projects with different cash flow timings. So let's say 1,000. We have here the NPV and we have the uh, IRR. Again, if you consider IR to decide, Project B would be the choice. However, Project A has the higher NPV and is an ideal choice. IRR of irregularly spaced cash flows. Your cash flow may sometimes be irregularly spaced. In such a case, you cannot use IRR as IRR requires equally spaced time intervals. You can use XIRR instead, which, make, which takes into account the dates of the cash flow along with the cash flows. So again, irregularly spaced, so we have used XIRR. So we have here C3 to C6 and then B3 to B6, these are the dates. So our IRR now is 26.42%. Modified IRR. Consider a case when your finance rate is different from your reinvestment rate. If you calculate internal rate of return with IRR, it assumes the same rate for both finance and reinvestment. Further, you might also get multiple IRRs. For example, consider the cash flow given below. We have the finance rate and reinvestment rate. So here, we have 016, the cash flows. So these are the cash flows. So discount rate and we have the net present values as you observe in PV is zero more than once so zero more than zero more than once resulting in multiple IRR further reinvestment rate is not taken into account in such cases you can use modified IRR or MIRR so MIRR now will be the function then D6 to D8 so these are the cash flows D2 this is the finance rate in D3 this is the investment rate so here we did not use those values we just use NPV so the modified RR now, so result will give us 7% as shown below. So unlike IRR, MIRR will always be unique. Okay, so that ends our lecture for the day. So at least it will give you a, a bird's eye view, an overview of some financial functions that are used in Microsoft Excel for financial analysis. So thank you very much for viewing this video.